Amen. You may be seated. Again, it's good to be here and good to see all of you here. And um, I'd like for us to pause for just a moment before I really get started here. And um, uh, some of you already know this, some of you may not. But um, last week, Jenny's aunt died and her, her aunt by marriage. And we went to Southern Illinois and I preached the funeral. And uh, um, was it Friday, Jenny, that Dewey died? Her husband died Friday, and so we're going to be going back up there, and I'll preach the funeral again, but here's the funny thing about that whole story. You know, we always try to find laughter and everything. Um, one of the grandsons told his mother after the funeral, he said, Mom, we got preached to today. His mama said, I knew we would. That's why I asked him to come and do it. So when she texted and asked if I would preach this funeral, I told her that I would, and Jenny replied for me and told her that, uh, to tell Trevor that he's going to get preached to again. <laughs> so that's a wonderful opportunity to share the gospel. Um, you may think this is a bit morbid, but I really enjoy funerals better than weddings. Get that? Somebody said, well, they're about the same thing, aren't they? But no. Um, but at a funeral, you have people there who are there out of respect for the deceased that may not ever get to hear the gospel, the good news, the Jesus story any other time. And I hate to pass up an opportunity, so I preach the Jesus story every time I have the opportunity at funerals. And lots of people get saved as a result of that. So let's pray for her family and ask the Lord to bless them. Father, I thank you because you're good and you're kind and you're gracious. I thank you for Dewey and for Doris and their profession of faith in you, their faithfulness to you, and Lord, their love for you. And Father, I just pray that you'd bless that family and comfort them and Lord, just draw them close to yourself. And Lord, at this funeral service, if there's somebody there that um, has never really comprehended the story of your great love for the human race, I pray that, that Wednesday would be their day. Lord, you just bless in all the ways you know that they need, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name, and for his sake, and amen. All right, so we're going to continue our, our series of sermons in the book of Revelation. We have made it up to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to start today with verse 16, and we're going to cover part of the next scene in this vision that John received in chapter 14 of the Revelation. And you realize Revelation was written in about 96 AD by John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the same guy that wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, also wrote the Revelation. He was the longest living of all the other apostles. He was still alive after most of the rest of them. In fact, all of the rest of them had gone on to be with the Lord. And John wrote the revelation from the Isle of Patmos, which was a, a, a dry, barren rock that stuck up over the surface of the Mediterranean Sea, about 35 miles or so out from the coast of where the ancient city of Ephesus used to stand. And John was out there as a political criminal because he had been preaching the word of God and Christianity had been declared an illegal religion in the Roman Empire. So John was convicted of, of promulgating promoting an illegal religion in the empire. So they deemed him to be a political criminal, put him out there in exile on this island, and there were salt mines out there. And John was put out there as an old man to work in the salt mines. And so God intervened and, and gave John this series of visions that he wrote down and we have today as the book of Revelation. John was able to smuggle it out and send it back to the mainland by uh, messengers called angels of the churches. And uh, that word angelos in Greek means a messenger. So he, he sent these messengers back with these copies of the Revelation to the seven churches in Asia. And so today we are in chapter 14, which is another one of those series of visions that John received and recorded. And this is what he wrote in uh, verse 16, and then we'll jump down and read some in verse 19, because, because the title of this lesson is the first of two harvests. It becomes very clear in this section of John's vision that there were two harvests. And today we're going to study the first of the two harvests. But let me show you this. It says this in verse 16. He who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. That's harvest number one. And then down in verse number 19, the angel swung his sickle on the earth, 
gathered its grapes and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. When you gather the grapes, what is that? That's another harvest. That's harvest number two. Now, we need to understand that and we need to recognize that we're reading in this section of the chapter about two separate and distinct harvests. So in this section of the Revelation that we're going to begin examining in this lesson, John saw in yet another vision these two harvests. The first completed by one who was seated on the cloud. And we're going to learn as we go through here that that is no doubt the Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember, this is the Revelation of Jesus Christ. It is revealing to the world the role that he will play throughout human history from 96 AD on, including the winding up of the age and the bringing in of his thousand-year kingdom, and then the eternal kingdom. How Jesus is going to, to be actively involved in all of that is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And then the second harvest completed by a character simply called the angel. One is Jesus seated on a cloud, the other one is an angel. Two harvests, two separate harvesters. The first harvest likely represents Jesus returning to harvest his people from the earth. The second harvest likely represents the harvest of unbelievers from the earth. And in today's lesson, we are going to examine the first of those two harvests, the harvest of the believers from the earth. As we'll see, there are two separate resurrections described in Scripture. Jesus will come back, and part of this harvesting process is uh, in the first harvest is uh, the resurrection and then the rapture, the snatching away of the believers, harvesting them from the earth. And then, and then there is another one, uh, one for unbelievers, and that happens about a thousand years later. These two resurrections are separated by a little over a thousand years of time. John described these two separate resurrections when he wrote the, the, the verses that, that, that we have already looked at, as well as other verses in the Revelation. I want you to notice what he wrote in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. He wrote this, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. Well, obviously, these are believers who had been martyred for their faith. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. Evidently, believers who are here at the beginning of that second three and a half years of the tribulation period and had refused to align themselves with the political and religious system of the global government of the Antichrist. And so here we have them. They are standing firm, but they lose their lives. And then look, and they came to life. Now, the fact that it says they came to life means what? They're already dead. They have died. But what happens again? They came to life. That's the resurrection of these believers, the first of the two harvests here in Revelation 14. And it says, and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. There's a global government of Jesus on planet Earth following the tribulation period that lasts a thousand years. And these, these believers who are a part of this first harvest have the opportunity to be a part of that government and actually rule and reign with Christ for those thousand years. But then look at what he said. In the next verse, he says, the rest of the dead, that would be the unbelieving dead, those who died without Christ, did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So do you get that? That's why I told you earlier that there is a little over a thousand years of time that elapsed between the first harvest and the second harvest that we're reading about. And here, when he talks about these resurrections of both the believer and the non-believer, he indicates that they are separated by this thousand years of time. And he says, this is the first resurrection. The resurrection of those believers that he has already seen, those that were martyred and those that refused to align themselves with the policies of the Antichrist and lose their life because of that. This, when they come to life again, this is the first resurrection. And that's the first harvest we read about in Revelation chapter 14. Now the resurrection of believers and the rapture of believers occurs shortly after the beginning of the final three and a half years of the tribulation period. This is the resurrection that John was describing when he wrote these words that we already read in Revelation 14, 16. He who was seated on the cloud, that's Jesus, 
swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. This, according to the language that's used in these verses from the Greek text, this was a grain harvest. And we'll examine this harvest in today's lesson. But it's a grain harvest. What about the second harvest? It's a grape harvest. Two, two distinctly separate commodities being harvested in these two harvests. Now, the resurrection and the judgment of unbelievers occurs at the close of the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. It is a grape harvest. This is the resurrection John was describing there in verse 19 of Revelation 14 when he wrote, The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. And we'll talk about that one next week. So today let's talk about this first harvest. I've tried to lay the foundation for you and show you that there are two harvests in this vision. One's a grain harvest, one's a grape harvest. One is executed by Jesus himself. The other one is executed by one of his surrogates, an angel. But let's look at this first harvest. The first harvest in, in, in John's vision is obviously a description of God harvesting his people from the earth just after the beginning of the final three and a half years of the tribulation period. Notice what John wrote in Revelation 14, 14. He said, I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with the crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And by the way, a sickle is a tool that's used in the process of harvesting grain. And so you've got the one seated on the white cloud... That's obviously Jesus. Mark described Jesus as coming in clouds. He wrote this in Mark 13, 26. He says, at that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. The mere fact that the one who comes to do the harvesting is seated on a white cloud uh, it indicates that it's the same person that John, or excuse me, that Mark is talking about when he wrote those words in Mark 13, 26, referring to Jesus, the Son of Man. He says he's going to see him coming in the clouds and he's going to have power and great glory. An angel explained to Jesus' disciples that he would return the same way that he left. Luke described how he left. And this is what Luke wrote in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, the last part of that verse, down through verse number 11. He wrote, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Get that? So how did he leave? He left in the clouds. A cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking up intently into the sky, and as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So I want you to get that. He's coming back the same way that he left. When he left, a cloud hid him from their sight. When he returns, he will come back in the same way. He left in a cloud. He's going to come back in a cloud. And that's what John sees in this vision in Revelation 14. He sees one seated on a cloud, and that's the one who thrust his sickle into the earth and harvests unbelie I mean, excuse me, believers from the earth. So it's fitting. It's fitting that Jesus would come to harvest God's people wearing a crown of gold. The crown that Jesus is wearing in this vision is not the crown of power and authority worn by a king, even though he is the king, he's the Christ, and Revelation calls him the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So he is a king, but this particular crown that we see in this vision is the garland placed on the head of a victorious athlete in one of the ancient Olympic games. In the case of Jesus, he won the contest for the souls of men. In the case of Jesus, he came and fought against the devil and all the enemies of righteousness in order to redeem for himself a chosen people, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. And he did that and redeemed us, bought us back out of the slave market of sin at great personal cost. It cost him everything. It cost him his physical life on the cross. 
And that's why Paul wrote, thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As an athlete, Jesus came and fought for us. He won the contest because he knew that we were the prize. We were the crown. And so here he is with a golden garland on his head, a victorious athlete who has won the race and has been recognized for the victory that he won. And then he turns around and gives that victory to us. Isn't that what he says here? Who giveth us, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we don't win the victory. Jesus has already won it for us. And when we believe that, when we believe what the Bible says about him, we begin to understand who he is and what he did, and that he did that also we can have the incredible gift of eternal life. When we receive that, it is because he gave us the victory. Listen, if you want to be a winner, you better get on the Jesus team. If you're going to be a winner, you better sign up with him and get on his team. Or you, along with the devil, are going to be the worst losers in human history. And we'll talk about that next week. But I love this. He's given us the victory. Most of the world today does not understand that. Are you aware of that? In fact, a significant section of today what is called Christian churches don't understand that. Now, I'm not saying the people in those churches aren't Christians, that they're not believers and don't have eternal life, but I'm saying they don't understand this concept because somehow they believe that you have to work really hard to earn the victory. You're aware of that, right? Uh, some people just out and out believe that, that you just got to work and earn your eternal life. And if you work hard enough, you get it as a reward. Some people believe that it's a mixture, that it's a mixture between God's grace and your best effort. <laughs> Neither one of those are true. You get that? The Apostle Paul explained that when he said, <laughs> if, it's, if, it's, if it's grace, then it's not by works. And if it's works, it's not by grace. Because the two can't mix. Otherwise, works would not be works and grace would not be grace. You see, it's not one or the other. I mean, it is one or the other. It can't be a mixture of the two. And, and the idea, the mere idea that somehow we could do something that would warrant us being worthy to get eternal life and that we could somehow earn eternal life by our best effort is really a slap in the face at Jesus. Because what that really means is what happened to him on the cross was the biggest joke that God ever played on the human race. If there was any other way we could get to heaven other than the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, any other way than what happened on that hill outside the city of Jerusalem was a travesty. But the simple fact, there is no other way. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You see, it's all about Jesus winning the contest. It's about Jesus being victorious over death and hell and the grave and the devil and every enemy that there has ever been to righteousness. It's about him winning. And because he won, we win. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the next verse John wrote in Revelation 14 is intriguing. This is what he wrote. It's in verse 15. Then another angel came out of the temple. This is another angel in addition to the three angels John wrote about in verses 6 through 13 in this chapter. You remember last week, the week before last, we talked about those three angels? Or three angels, one after another? And, and, and now he says, now there's another angel that comes out. Um, the first character that came out in this part of the vision was Jesus on a white cloud. But now another angel comes out and he called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, I read a lot of, I read a lot. And I read a lot of commentaries on this chapter in preparation to be able to teach you what this says. And I've read a lot through the years when I would have questions about this stuff. And, and there's, there's, there's a, a certain number of people out there when they write about this, they say that this verse proves that the fellow seated on the white cloud is not Jesus. Because you got an angel telling Jesus what to do. 
And they said, that just doesn't add up. An angel, a subordinate, telling Jesus what to do. Well, let me give you another take on that. Jesus has to be informed by someone when the time is right for him to thrust in his sickle and harvest the earth. You know why? Because he doesn't know the time. The only thing I can find in all of the Bible that Jesus has chosen not to know is the exact time of his return for this harvest. So God in the temple sends a messenger out of the temple to tell Jesus, it's time, thrust in your sickle and harvest the earth. Because look what happens here. That's what it says here. It says that this angel, another angel, came out of the temple and, and he called in a loud voice because he evidently wanted Jesus to hear him. He called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come. Do you get that? He's not ordering him to do something. He's informing him that you can go ahead and do what you want to do now because the time has come. Take your sickle and reap because the time has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. What does it mean when the harvest is ripe? It's time for the harvest to begin. And the angel simply comes and informs Jesus of the only thing in all of human history, in all of the Bible that I can find that Jesus has chosen not to know, and that is the time of his return for this harvest. Jesus had to be informed by this angel coming out of God's temple when it is time to begin his harvest of the earth because he doesn't know what that or when that time will be. Only the Father knows. So the Father informed the angel who then informed Jesus. And Matthew, Matthew wrote this in Matthew 24, 36. About that day or hour, and this is talking about the return of Christ. About that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven. That's why God had to inform the angel before the angel could inform Jesus. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. So what does that say? Of that day and of that hour... No one knows, not the angels, nor the Son, but only the Father. Do you see that? This isn't a matter of levels of authority where an angel is bucking authority and trying to get in a position of authority over Jesus. This is simply an angel being under the authority of the Father, informing Jesus about the only thing Jesus does not know, and that's the moment he's going to come back again and do this harvest. When the right times come, when the right time comes, the harvest of God's people will begin. The angel said to Jesus, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Listen, friends, the time is coming. The harvest is ripening. And when the time comes and the harvest is ripe, God will dispatch an angel from the temple to inform his son, Jesus, sitting on a cloud with a sickle in his hand, that the time's right. And suddenly, unexpectedly, like a thief in the night, Jesus will return and harvest every believer from the earth. Paul described this harvest of believers when he wrote this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. He wrote, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command makes me wonder if that might not be the voice of this angel that God dispatched. Comes with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up, will be snatched up, will be raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You know why we're going to be caught up in the clouds? Because he's coming back on a cloud. Isn't that what that says? We're going to be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, in the atmosphere above the earth. And so we will be with the Lord forever. What a great day that will be. John summed up the completion of this harvest when he wrote in Revelation 14, 16. So he who was seated on the clouds swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Job completed. In just an instant, 
This harvest of God's people begins and then is completed. The angel gives the man command. Jesus swings his sickle and the harvest is completed. Paul confirmed the incredible brevity of this harvest when he wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. We will not all sleep. In other words, we won't all be dead when this harvest begins. There will be some believers who are still alive. We will not all sleep, a reference to our physical body sleeping in death in the grave. Do you realize that when the Bible uses the word sleep to describe death, it's never describing the spirit of a man. It's always describing his body lying in a grave in a position of sleep. His spirit is always actively either in the body or at home with Jesus. You get that? Some people believe the idea that, that when you die and they bury you, then the, the whole man body spirit and soul are in the grave not so the thing that causes physical death is the spirit leaves the body and then the body is asleep in the grave but the spirit is very alive and active in the presence of jesus so he says we will not all sleep but we will all be changed if you're not dead when jesus comes back again and your body called out of the grave and fashioned into a new body fit for eternity with jesus rather than 70 or 80 years here if you're not among those you will still be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we we that's a reference to the believers who are still living when jesus returns we will be changed you get that the deteriorated bodies of believers in the grave will be called out they'll be changed and fashioned into new bodies and reunited with the spirits that jesus brings with him of those believers and then those of us who are living will be walking along about our business and suddenly in a flash in a twinkling of an eye we'll be changed man i would love to still be alive when that happens and see this old worn out mess changed into something good again you get that that's what's going to happen we're going to be changed in a moment and then twinkling of an eye. Wow. So here's what I want to talk to you about for just a moment about that verse. Please don't make the mistake of thinking you can wait until this first harvest begins to get ready to be in it. Please don't do that. Don't think, I'll wait until, until I hear the trumpet sound, and then I'll fall to my knees and get it all right with Jesus. Listen, you're not going to have time to do that when this happens. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The, the amount of times it takes for a, a ray of light to, to reflect off of your cornea in your eye and cause your eye to, to twinkle just that quick. This harvest will start and be completed, and if you're not already ready to be in it, you're not going to have time to get in it at that moment. Don't be living as if you could do that because that's the devil's lie to get you to miss being in this harvest. Oh, you need to understand that. At that point, you won't have time to prepare because it'll happen in a flash in the twinkling of an eye. So you need to be ready. Isn't that the message of many of the parables, many of the stories that Jesus told? Isn't it all about being ready when he comes back again? The, the ten virgins, five were ready, five weren't. You get it? The, the, the guy who, did, who, who didn't want his house to be broken into, he was expecting the thief to come, so he was ready. He didn't know when he was going to come, but he was ready. You get that? The issue is be ready. You say, well, how do I be ready? How, do I, how can I get ready and know that I am, that I am really going to be in this first harvest and not be left here for the second harvest? Here's how you know. You can be ready for the first harvest if you believe in Jesus. If you've understood and believed the Jesus story and believed it so strongly that you've called on Jesus 
to give you the incredible gift of eternal life, then you can be ready for this harvest. Now, there's a lot of other things he wants you to do, but the thing that guarantees you a place in this harvest is receiving the incredible gift of eternal life. I want you to know it is significantly important to be a part of this first harvest, this first resurrection, because John wrote this in Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy are those who share in this first resurrection. You get that? This first harvest, this first resurrection. The second death. You say the second death? That's what he mentions there. The second death, he says, has no power over them. So what about the second death? Well, the first death is physical death. The second death is spiritual death, which includes eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. So it, it, in order to be in this first harvest, you have to have done what it takes to escape the power of the second death, of spiritual death. And the only thing that can help you escape the power of the second death, this, this spiritual death that, that it is permanent and unresolvable and will ultimately get you into the lake of fire, the only thing you can do to avoid that is to believe in Jesus and get the incredible gift of eternal life. That's the only thing you can do. And that's what he promises here. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. To secure your place in this first harvest, you must believe the Jesus story and receive the gift of eternal life. Jesus said it like this. This is my life verse. This is, I don't know if you ever noticed, but I managed to work this into almost every sermon. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not I love that. Is that a promise? Shall not perish, but have eternal life. 